Welcome to worship with Clinton Presbyterian Church. Thank you everyone for joining us either in person or online this morning. We are glad you have joined us for worship. As we listen to the prelude, please take a deep breath, settle into your space, and look around at the beautiful faces of those who are gathered here this morning. Let us pray. As sunflowers seek the sun, we come here seeking your face, O oh God. Hear our prayers. Revive us from the slumber of violence, greed, and willful ignorance. Raise us up like a host of sunflowers, ready to spread seeds of new life. Amen. Please join me in taking a moment to greet one another with peace. Don't forget to come up to the camera and greet the folks on Zoom. The peace of Christ be with you all.
number 134. three parts. One part is for me. One will be for anyone who is in the sanctuary in person this morning in italics. And one will be for those joining us remotely in bold. Those joining us via Zoom, please unmute your mic so we can hear you. God, we have come to put your words into our hearts and souls. We are here to remember your promises. We are here to remember your love. Speak of it when we are at home. And to remember it when we are far away. God, put your words and your love into our hearts. Amen. Amen. Hear the call to reconciliation. Jesus calls us as members of the church to be accountable to God and to one another, confessing our sin, repairing the damage done, and working together for reconciliation. And Jesus promises that he will be with us in this work, whatever two or three gather in his name. Let us pray. God of our ancestors, you have remained faithful to us from generation to generation, but we have broken our promises. We test your patience and question your good news. Forgive us, we pray. Recreate us as your people and restore us to your image. Continue to bless us and let us be a blessing for others. Amen. Hear the act of praise. We are forgiven, we are forgiven, we are forgiven for all the things we have done and the things we failed to do. We are forgiven, we are forgiven, we are forgiven for our sins against God and our sins against one another. We are forgiven, we are forgiven, we are forgiven, not just seven times or 77 times, or even 70 times seven, but over and over and always. Thanks be to God. We're going to sing hymn number 603.
First reading this morning comes from Matthew chapter 11, verses 16 to 19 and 25 to 30. But to what will I compare this generation? It is like children sitting in the marketplaces and calling to one another. We play the flute for you, and you did not dance. We wailed, and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say, he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collector and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by her deeds. At that time, Jesus said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you that are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my joke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my joke is easy and my burden is light. This is the word, the word of the Lord. So our second scripture reading is taken from the book of Genesis, chapter 18, verses 1 through 15. The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. He said, If I have found favor in your eyes, my lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought, that you may then wash your feet and rest under this tree. Let me get you something to eat so that you may be refreshed and then go on your way now that you have come to your servant. Very well, they answered. Do as you say. So Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah. Quick, he said. Get three sayers of fine flour and knead it and bake some bread. Then he ran to the herd, collected a choice tender calf, and gave it to a servant who hurried to prepare it. 
He then brought some curds and milk and the calf that had been prepared and set these before them. While they ate, he stood near them under a tree. Where is your wife, Sarah? They asked him. There in the tent, he said. Then the Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already old and well advanced in years, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, after I am worn out and my master is old, will I now have this pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return at you, return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she lied and said, I didn't laugh. But he said, yes, you laughed. Since Pastor Megan's sabbatical and our summer worship has been centered around hospitality, I decided to forego the, lec the lectionary passages for this week to return in part to this earlier reading. And with it, I hope to kill two birds with one stone, namely to contrast a story about hospitality with a story about one that isn't, and then also to dismiss one of the Bible's clobber passages. As you can already tell, we'll be looking at Genesis chapter 18 and 19. Now these chapters may be considered bookends with one describing how to treat strangers and the other describing how not to street, treat strangers. To recap chapter 18, Abraham is sitting in the entrance to his tent by the Oaks of Mamre, which by the way is near the present day Hebron. In the heat of the day when he sees three travelers walking up the road towards his encampment. In accordance with the customs of his time, Abraham approaches the travelers, bows before them, invites them to stop for a rest and a meal. When they agree, he then sets off to prepare things. And I gotta tell you, I always get a chuckle out of this narrative having him say to Sarah, quick, prepare some cakes. And then he runs off to get a calf from his herd, handing it to a servant to prepare. Remember, this is 4,000 years ago. No, grab from the freezer and pop into the microwave. Preparing this meal will take several hours. When the meal is ready, Abraham presents it to the travelers, standing over them, looking to their every need as they eat. And by the way, it's not a quick grab and go meal either. Its consumption by the travelers will be leisurely. I'm sure we've all experienced this kind of hospitality, either as the host or the guest at a Thanksgiving or an Easter dinner or other celebratory meal with friends, or perhaps in a kitchen, helping to serve meals to those in need. I experienced biblical hospitality numerous times during my visit to Cameroon in late 2010. I mean, right after Pastor Cindy Shelby Dickinson, De Devin Dickinson and I arrived in country on the way from the airport in Douala to our hotel in Limbe with Joseph and Patience Awasume as our chaperones, we stopped at a relative's house and even though it was late in the evening, they laid out quite a spread for us. Back to the story. As they're eating, Abraham realizes his guests are God and two angels. It is here we get the wonderful passage where God tells Abraham that Sarah will give birth to a son within a year. Sarah, listening behind a curtain, laughs to herself at the idea that her, at her age and Abraham's, she will have pleasure. God, being godlike, then says, why did Sarah laugh? Sarah, frightened, emerges from behind the curtain saying, I didn't laugh. God then replies, hopefully good-naturedly, yes, you laughed. 
Of course, everything happens as God says, and the child is named Yitzhak, or Isaac, which means he laughs. Rest break over, the angels head off towards Sodom. God stays behind and reveals his plans for Sodom to Abraham. He's going to nuke Sodom and Gomorrah. He tells Abraham that there is much wickedness in Sodom, saying, how great is the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah, how, and how very grave their sin. Have you ever wondered how it is that Gomorrah got roped into this? I wonder if Gomorrah's relationship to Sodom wasn't like Belarus's relationship to Russia in our own time, a willing, unwilling partner. Again, back to the story. At this point, there's a clever dialogue between God and Abraham during which Abraham tries to talk God down on the destruction, getting God to agree not to nuke Sodom and Gomorrah for the sake of 10 righteous men. Well, unfortunately, as you know, there weren't even 10 righteous men in Sodom. It took the two angels several more hours before they reached Sodom. And as chapter 19 opens, it is evening, darkness is falling, and soon the gates of the city will be shut for the night. Lot, Abraham's nephew, is sitting in the gate, and like his uncle, seeing the two travelers approaching, goes to them, bows, and invites them to come to his home for a meal and a place to spend the night. The travelers say, no thanks, we'll just hang out in the city square. That was the angel's original plan in the mission pre-brief, by the way. Lot, however, will not take no for an answer and continues to insist they accept his hospitality to the point where he's almost pleading with them. Finally, they relent and agree to accompany Lot to his home. Why is Lot so adamant about this? You know why. If there was such a thing as traveler's advisories in that day and age, there would have been one warning travelers against being caught within the walls of Sodom or Gomorrah after the gates are closed for the night. Now our travelers knew this, as did their boss. This was the reason for the mission, as does Lot. The travelers accompany Lot to his home he feeds them and provides them with a place to sleep, but just as everybody is about to bed down for the night, there's a pounding on the door. It is the men of Sodom, we are told, from the youngest to the oldest. And in Genesis chapter 19, verse 5, they yell in at Lot, where are the two travelers? Bring them out. At this point, the subjectiveness of translation kicks in. There are a number of words in biblical Hebrew that imply, or are euphemisms for, things of a sexual nature. This is where one of them is used. Believe it or not, Seinfeld fans, am I dating myself? The word used here is yada. The classic translation of yada, as in the King James Version, is that we might know them. This, by the way, is where English gets its own euphemism to know in the biblical sense. Other translations read that we might be <clears throat> intimate with them, or that we might have intercourse with them. Our NIV Pew Bibles are more direct, that we may have sex with them. It is because of these renderings that Genesis chapter 19, verse 5 has become a clobber passage used by people calling themselves Christians to condemn us LGBTQ folks. All of these renderings are taken from committee translations where the consensus seemed to be a desire to soften the meaning. And each uses a word that implies consent. 
but three single person translations. James Moffat's The Bible, A New Translation from 1922. Garrett Vercoyle's The Berkeley Version in Modern English from 1959. And Kenneth Taylor's The Living Bible from 1971 get to the true meaning. Bring them out that me, we may rape them. Rape. That's what we're talking about here. Not mutual, consensual sex, but rape. And not just rape, but gang rape. The men of Sodom refused the opportunity suggested by Lot to know his virgin daughters instead that tells us what they really want is not about sex. If it's not about sex, what's it about then? In truth, rape has very little to do with sex. Rape is about control. Rape is about power and dom domination on the part of the rapist and degradation, humiliation, and helplessness on the part of the victim. Excuse the bluntness, but in our species in the act of procreation, the male penetrates, or as the King James puts it, goes in unto the female. Consequently, civilizations, societies, cultures, since time immemorial, have been built on the old and somewhat vulgar maxim, the one who penetrates, dominates. Meaning the male is superior, the female inferior. In Abraham's time, and indeed in our own, Civilization, society, culture is predominantly androcentric, that is, male-centric, that is to say, male-dominated, macho, patriarchal. If you doubt me on this, consider the Dobbs decision overturning Roe v. Wade, or the legislation passed by androcentric legislatures in so-called red states restricting a woman's control over her own body. But I digress. In this androcentric, masculine, testosterone-infused world of Abraham's time, and indeed our own, to be a male and to be penetrated is the consummate disgrace. It is to have your sense of maleness and manhood ripped from you. It is to be inferior. It is to be no better than a woman. This, I believe, is the root of homophobia and transphobia. To a manly man, it is not only inconceivable that a man should be sexually attracted to other men, but that such men would allow themselves to be penetrated or give up the prerogatives of maledom to be their true selves as female? Ah, <sighs> the horror. They must be sick. They must be dealt with severely lest this contagion spread. But I digress again. To strip them of their sense of manliness is what the men of Sodom had in mind for any male visitor. Reading between the lines, one can infer that Lot, who settled in the vicinity of Sodom and later in the city itself, may have been a recipient of the men of Sodom's special brand of inhospitality. Why he stayed afterwards is never explained. Now, one of the things to understand about the Torah, especially the book of Genesis, 
is it is a mishmash of stories from various sources skillfully woven together by scribes during the Babylonian exile in the 6th century BC based on stories collected and written down during the 10th century BC of stories orally transmitted for generations before that. At the end of chapter 13, in verse 13, there is a line apropos of nothing else, just out of nowhere, stating the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. Now, I just have to say, the first time I read that, and it's from the Revised Standard Version, I read it the way you'd say it in New England. They were wicked sinners. In chapter 14, Verses 8 to 11, there's the narrative of a war between Sodom and its neighboring city-states in which they defeat Sodom. I wonder if this war wasn't precipitated in part by their inhospitality, by the inhospitality of the men of Sodom shown to male citizens of these neighboring city-states passing through Sodom's territory. Back to the story. We can infer also that this is not the first time Lot has spoiled the fun of the men of Sodom. It may not have been the first time Lot spoiled the fun, but as far as the men of Sodom were concerned, this would be the last time. Indeed, it was the last time for the men of Sodom, just not in the way they had envisioned, because the angels themselves spoil the fun by blinding the men of Sodom urging Lot and his family to leave the city, and when Lot and his family are a safe distance away, nuking Sodom and Gomorrah. Forgive the pun, but what drives the men of Sodom to do this? To show such inhospitality as to sexually assault foreigners passing through their territory? Well, according to the Mishnah, or commentaries about Sodom in other places in the Bible, Sodom's great sin and its destruction is not about sex. It's about Sodom's arrogance, pridefulness, sense of ethnic superiority, and subsequent lack of hospitality towards strangers. So let's look at some of these Mishnah. This is your turn to play. Grab a pew Bible, or if you're home, grab a Bible. If you want to read the passage aloud, raise your hand. We'll get you a microphone. Or if you're playing online, if you're playing online, yeah, you can uh, unmute. So the first passage, and if you can see it on the screens or see it in the share, is Isaiah 3 verses 8 and 9. And like I say, if you want to read it aloud to all of us, raise your, raise your hand and we'll get, you, we'll get you a microphone. So it's Isaiah 3, 8 and 9. Yep, I see a hand up in the back. Are you going to be there? Are you going to stump around with your... Okay. Yeah. I need to So this is Isaiah 3, 8 through 9. Jerusalem staggers, Judah is falling. Their words and deeds are against the Lord, defying his glorious presence. They look on their faces, testifies against them. They parade their sin like Saddam. They do not hide it. Woo to them. They have brought disaster upon themselves. So that was Isaiah 3, verses 8 and 9. So next we have Jeremiah, chapter 23, verse 14. Remember, it's Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel. So Jeremiah 23, 14. Jeremiah 23, 14. He says, I will build myself a great palace with spacious upper rooms. 2314. Oops, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And a 
among the prophets of Jerusalem, I have seen something horrible. They commit adultery and live a lie. They strengthen the hands of evildoers so that no one turns from his wickedness. They are all like Sodom. So for, if you didn't hear it, and among the prophets of Jerusalem, I have seen something horrible. They commit adultery and live a lie. They strengthen the hands of evildoers so that no one turns from his wickedness. They are all like Sodom to me, the people of Jerusalem like Gomorrah. All right, next we have Ezekiel, chapter 16, verses 48 to 50. Ezekiel 16, 48 to 50. As surely as I live, declares the Sovereign Lord, your sister Sodom and her daughters never did what you and your daughters have done. Now this was the scene of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy. One more line. They were haughty and did detestable things before me. Therefore, I did away with them as you have seen. There we go. All right, now to the New Testament. And the two next two readings are somewhat similar. The first is Matthew chapter 10, verses 11 through 15. Whatever town or village you enter, search for some worthy person there and stay at his house until you leave. As you enter the home, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it is not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake off the dust of your feet when, I, when you leave that home or town. I will tell you the truth. If you will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than the for that town. So the next one, as I say, Luke 10, verses 10 to 13 are similar. No hurry. Have you found it yet? But when you, en when you enter a town and you are not welcome, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that sticks to our feet will wipe off against you. Yet, be sure of this, the kingdom of God is near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on, the day, on that day for Sodom than for that town. That was good. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bas Bethsaida. Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyr Tyre. and Sidon, Sidon, they would have repl replanted long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. And finally, 2 Peter 2, verses 6 through 9. Is there anyone online that wants to read that one? Go for it. Is that, is that Calvin? I can't quite say. Yeah. Okay, go for it. Okay. 
charges against them and what they have to say. This is I just go over this all the time. All right, since we've had audio difficulties here. If he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah by burning them to ashes and made them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued Lot, a righteous man who was distressed by the filthy lies of lawless men, for that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds he saw and heard, if this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue godly men from trials and hold the unrighteous for the day of judgment. To finish up, if for some reason you want to get a sense of the Sodom mindset of arrogance, pridefulness, sense of superiority, and resulting in, hospi on, uh, in hospitality, pin on a pride button and visit Westboro Baptist Church in Topeka, Kansas, Steadfast Baptist Church in Fort Worth, Texas, Faithful World Baptist Church in Tempe, Arizona. What is it with the Baptists? Or closer to home, Abiding Truth Ministries in Springfield. If you believe, as I do, that hell is the place where God isn't, in visiting these churches, you may well be entering hell as well. To wrap up, Genesis chapters 18 and 19 are bookends telling stories of hospitality and inhospitality. The actions of Abraham and Lot are examples of how to treat strangers. The actions of the men of Sodom, the mindset that accompanies these actions, the consequences of their inhospitality, and the Mishnahs throughout the rest of the Bible concerning Sodom are a cautionary tale of how not to treat strangers. As to Genesis 19 being a clobber passage, I think we can see it's not about anything LGBTQ related. A last thought. Abraham and Lot had no idea who the travelers were when they showed them hospitality. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 2 reminds us, don't forget to show hospitality to strangers for some have entertained angels without realizing it. Amen. Good morning. We have now entered um, the time for prayers of the people. And we start with how many affirmations? Four affirmations, or is it five? Five. <laughs> As we enter into prayer today, let us lift up all these people and places circumstances and situations that demand an uncommon hope. We pray for our world. We pray for our neighbors. We pray for this community. We pray for our deepest concerns. Jesus, you come to us triumphant and humble, victorious and peaceful. Help us to be prisoners and proclaimers of an uncommon hope. 
call us to a higher possibility as agents of restorative justice, carrying forward the transforming work of grace that we have received from ancestors of the faith. We ask for these and other blessings in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Call for the offering. Thanks to everyone who has shown love for our community by giving to support the church this week. God calls us, God's call to us is woven into the very fabric of creation. For God has given to us every good thing, entrusting us to be stewards of all we have received. If you are able, please take a moment to visit our online giving site or mail your offering to the church. Those in person, you are invited to bring your offering up to place, to place it in the basket after we have started singing. And we have a volunteer to guide us in a congregational song. Standing on the rock, standing on the rock. Standing on the rock, Jesus is the rock. Are you standing? Standing on the rock. Are you standing? Standing on the rock. Are you standing? Standing on the rock, Jesus is the rock. Standing on the rock. Standing on the rock. Standing on the rock, Jesus is the rock. Are you standing? Standing on the rock. Are you standing? Standing on the rock. Are you standing? Standing on the rock, Jesus is the rock. We are one. We are one. In the name of Jesus, we are one. 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 In the name of Jesus, we are one. I come from Africa. You come from USA. In the name of Jesus, we are one. You come from USA, I come from Africa. In the name of Jesus, you we, we are one. 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 In the name of Jesus, we are one. 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 We are one in the name of Jesus. We are one. Let us pray. Merciful God, we give you thanks that you have given us many different gifts for service in the one body of Christ. Use us, our gifts and offerings, to do your will in the world contributing to those in need, making peace with our neighbors, and overcoming evil with good. Amen. Announcements. We need volunteers, and uh, Jennifer will guide us in that volunteering task. And on July 23rd, we are having Christmas in July session. Session has approved a summertime collection to support the kiddos in Jen Dickinson's seventh grade classroom. Jen has been providing snacks and period products for the kids. We will collect them on July 23rd. 
Also, there is a sign-up sheet in the back of the sanctuary for you to let us know what your favorite Christmas carol is for July 23rd, Christmas in July. I'm interrupting you. Um, so actually, the sign-up never made it up here. So it's still downstairs by that okay. by the back door. Um, I'll play whatever. I just want to make sure we have the music and be able to get it on the slides and everything. So um, that's the planning process. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Um, so let us stand for the closing prayer. Please join me as you have in other parts of the service and one of the three parts of this prayer. One part is for me, the worship leader. One will be for anyone who is in the sanctuary in person this morning in, in italics. And one will be for those joining us remotely in bold. Those joining us on Zoom, please unmute your mic so we can hear you. We have been set free. We have been given new life. So we can bring new life to others. We have been blessed abundantly. So we can bless others. Listen for the voice of God calling you. God will go with us each step of the way. Amen. God from whom all blessings flow. Praise God, all creatures high and low. Alleluia, alleluia. Praise God in Jesus, fully known. Creator, Word, and Spirit, one. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Let us go in peace to love and serve God. Amen.